an explosion of a big problem in five years' time, uh, given the uh, inability to have control right now. Uh, how does it grow into a bigger problem? So that um, you know, we hopefully can address that and prevent that. Uh, yeah. And any interesting tools, examples, or scenarios which empower users with control um, that you think of are working fantastically well right now that we should be aware of or everyone should be aware of and use that as a shining example of that. Yep. Yep. So, um, we can start. Yep. yep, let's start the first question. Yep. Um, so, anyone has any questions or any um, thoughts in mind? Yep. So, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Is it working? Yeah, cheers. I'll, I'll be interested to know the context of your, the, the session we've got here where it focuses on uh, personal consumers uh, or uh, government departments. Like with Department of Internal Affairs, obviously, we take uh, personal data seriously for government, so I'm very interested here about the tools. And what we've got to say about not so much personal decision about the data is how the behavior can get views on when your data is held by someone else, such as government. It's obviously you can make a whole bunch of assumptions around what people are scared. Thank you. Um, can I answer that? Um, so, yeah, so the perspective is that we, are, as long as you rely on a third party to do something for you uh, in an IT environment, you are a user in our, in our situation, so you can be an, a government organization, you can be an individual, you can be a company. As long as you have a reliance on a trust relationship with a third party. Hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. So, does anyone have one? Uh, we have one. Hi, Mark. Um, I think uh, certification might be. Uh, Tackling in this discussion as well, it's important of certification about how to control data and where it's stored. And that um, might give you the right choice of um, you know, provider in, in this case. Thank you. Um, I um, am working with a school in Hawke's Bay, Henry Hall School, who have become paperless from years three to uh, six, and um, they're now under uh, a moderated learning environment. And so with everything that the students and the teachers do, which is based on the cloud, um, I suppose there has been one of the issues around um, parents' concern around how is that secure with their, um, with their children's learning? And I'm not completely sure around the data and control and everything like that, so that would be something that maybe you could enlighten me around that I could share back to the community in Napier. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, just feel free to ask all the questions and then we'll come back to you, for example, the certification one as well. You did mention certification. Which, which certifications are relevant? Um, I know ISO 27001 covers some of this stuff, but are there others? I'm not sure. Um, hi everyone, I've just come out of the Data Sovereignty Bar Camp next door, and one of the questions around data was where is it? Mm. Onshore, offshore? Mm. Yeah, Thank you. Um, I just wanted to chip in and say that uh, as a lawyer looking at contracts with cloud service providers, um, they're often very disheartening because you often don't get a lot of, you don't have a lot of leverage with you negotiating about finding out where your information will be. Um, there's often very limited liability about what happens if it goes wrong um, or if you get told about whether it goes wrong. It's, um, and it's very hard to negotiate because you have often one little business at New Zealand trying to negotiate with it. 
So it's, it's, it, I think it's a, a big problem and that you can identify what the problems are with your service provider that you're looking at, but you can't really do a lot to move them. Thank you. Um, I, I think an issue that, that's come up for us, sorry, Office of the Privacy Commissioner, um, is what happens when the, the data store or, or the cloud service you're using gets bought by another company or they go under, and particularly if they go under, if they're bankrupted, what happens to the servers and all the personal data on them? Um, it's, and, and jurisdiction and data sovereignty definitely plays into that if that's something that's happening overseas. Um, it's something we're watching and I don't have the answer for. So. Yeah. Yeah, uh, on the issue of, uh, of, of what you're signing up for, basically, and, and I think one of the exacerbating factors is that um, often, the, the, because of the network effect on the internet, you end up with one service that you, you really need to be a part of, and you lost your power, because that is the monopoly, effectively, the monopoly service. So um, one of the challenges uh, is how as, as we go along, was there, will, will that be counted by anything? Will there be competitive services that, are, that, that they allow, you to, allow people to offer uh, terms of service that uh, give you more control? Or, or will these monop uh, large players retain their monopolies and, and have no need to uh, outside of being regulated? And then we have that issue of data sovereignty that these are offshore providers in the main that we deal with. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the, the point that was just made over here about what happens if the data centre, the cloud host, um, goes under or, or sells or merge, merges, um, confession of a lawyer as well, um, uh, and we've dealt with this on both sides of the divide, and one of the things that we recently um, really had to do is that we went for a client who stores a um, huge amount of data based here in New Zealand um, uh, and very, some of the quite sensitive personal data. And they are storing that in a New Zealand data centre. Um, it's all documented in terms of this and all that sort of thing. But of course, the big question is what happens if that data centre falls over? Or what happens if the data centres, uh, uh, the building that they're hosted, the, the building that they're, they're leasing, for example, um, what happens if the lease falls over and you know the landlord blocks them out? All, all these sorts of um, uh, scary scenarios come up. And so you know, we have to go down the track of putting a house of attorney and all this sort of stuff in there. But it really is a partly a technical problem. What do you do if, if you physically actually can't uh, get to your data for some reason? It's partly technical, partly legal, partly practical, but it, it really is a, a bit of a gap in, in the um, uh, a lot of um, uh, business processes at the moment. You know, everyone, everyone, everyone understands, you know, IT security, oh, you know, encrypt everything, you know, you know, network encryption, you know, keep hackers out of everything. But there, there's still a lot of issues that there really isn't any sort of straightforward answer to. to share an anecdote rather than asking a question or making a specific comment. But in speaking with my consumer hat on rather than as um, someone from the Office of Privacy Commissioner, I had an issue a couple of years ago. I'm studying at Auckland University at the moment and one of the papers I did, I did a paper on the difficulties with regulating data privacy in a cloud computing environment. Um, the irony of the situation was that to submit my paper to Auckland University, I had to submit it to them and I had to submit it through Turnitin, which is a plagiarism checking mm. software thing, which is based in America. So I actually, knowing that, I made comments about Turnitin in my paper, so I'm not sure how well that was received. <laughs> yeah. But as a consumer through Auckland University, having no say about what's happening to my paper and knowing it's going overseas and having these issues with how it's going to be regulated over there was slightly frustrating. Thank you.
I guess as well, another um, interesting thing, having um, managed cloud services and also looked at overseas um, cloud services, both on the infrastructure of the service and software as a service side, you quite often get the case where you do offer services to other countries um, globally, and a lot of those services will have, you might be developing something with their test data, or it might be their live data that you end up developing with, but eventually they also need to have data centres outside of New Zealand as well. And so you get this mix of locales for different user groups, so some users may be located in England, some may be in South America, some may be in America itself, and some may be in New Zealand. And so there isn't an ability at the moment to provide that option of selecting a storage location or selecting a data storage location. Generally, we just put this off to um, load balance servers and throw them into a server farm or throw up several lines on the um, EC2 instances and servers like that. But I mean, you don't really get that choice, especially if there's something in the cloud that is using um, sort of more complex controls around your data, um, such as Hadoop or anything like that, where they are performing a large amount of processing on that data as well. You, those aren't provided on the technical aspect for them to actually say, oh, we want to use service only located here. So on the technical side, you can't determine from this um, infrastructure services where you want to locate all those servers on. Um, and so quite often the case is that the data is more than likely going outside of New Zealand unless it's a very specific, very closed-in service. Um, and that's a bit of an issue, I imagine, in that regard. So, um, so the cloud is pretty ubiquitous these days. I mean, any, any web app I buy and so on, it needs kind of persistent storage, uses cloud. I mean, I guess my question is how often is it actually a problem? You know? So, you know, our data is still by the world, so different jurisdictions and so on. Uh, a zoo uses six hour outage for a zoo on yes. Saturday. Uh, Australia and Missouri have a six hour outage Saturday so morning. Um, ask those users, you're on 99.9% .9%, uh, .9 uptime SLA. So that's eight hours a year. They've you know, they're three, two thirds of the way through that already. And, um, and, and, you're the New Zealand user, you've got no say in what goes on, you're not going to get any response. You have no comeback. So it is a problem, it's about the, um, you're making a choice about sticking on the cloud, you don't have to. You actually don't have to, but it's your data categorisation and how you think about your commercial data and your personal data, you're making that choice. And, yeah, so about going about that correctly is a big issue for uh, corporate, certainly corporates, which is I work for here to pack up an enterprise consulting space. Um, and it's a, the whole discussion about hybrid is a big, a big issue really, but people need to understand properly. The cloud is an action end point they should be heading towards. To what, how they want to deliver for their business is the actual outcome they should be thinking about. Most people, you know, we see a lot of, uh, you know, Lower level people, just the, the uh, Amazon and, and, and Zero and all those places that bright and shiny, but they're offshore and they all these other issues you raise. Thank you. Thank you. Just wanted to make a, a quick point on that um, cost, you know, risk analysis of, of the overseas um, use of offshore cloud. Or, or even the use of cloud. Um, the risk to your business, yes, there might be if you lose personal data, for instance. Uh, the risk of that breach in the paper, maybe there's some media attention, maybe that costs you a few customers, but the way we make decisions about uh, that sort of purchase, we don't actually factor in the cost on the people whose data is in the service, and, and that's kind of an exponential cost. The, you're only really considering a, f a fraction of the cost of a breach when, you, when you're making those decisions. That's right, Nick. A few years ago, um, for example, um, Dropbox was actually out for four hours um, because they, they did a faulty patch and they discovered the patch in 15 minutes, but um, because the cloud was so large, they 
they had to roll out the patch uh, re remediation over four hours. And uh, during those four hours, it was a uh, so if your boss is on the Dropbox as well, you don't need uh, his password to look at his files. So that was the implication of that. And um, and then Dropbox basically run on a major cloud provider uh, infrastructure as a service provider right now. And say, for example, in, in the case of uh, Amazon Web Services, if, uh, if Amazon's clouds were to go down one day, you will lose a lot of, um, a lot of uh, 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 other cloud-related um, services as well. Yeah. Uh, kia ora, uh, Simon from Trade Me here. Um, we run uh, data centers out of New Zealand uh, exclusively. We do have services that provide data outside of the, the jurisdiction. So Google Analytics is a great example. We don't know where that data goes necessarily. But for all the core Trade Me data, it's, it's either here in Auckland or in Wellington. Uh, and one of the reasons we do that is um, because we are pretty anally retentive about that stuff. We, we sweat the detail around uh, how our data centers work, where our data is stored, and, and the ability to go into the data center and physically look at the kit and, and replace it. Um, but one of the other reasons we don't use a um, an offshore service like, say, the cloud out of uh, Australia is bandwidth cost. So we are serving traffic to primarily Kiwis um, who are generating that traffic as well. And if we would have to ship that across to um, Australia and back again, it's actually quite cost prohibitive for us. Uh, and we see that when we have um, large um, email volumes, particularly off offshore, that, that that can really rack up. So there's a commercial imperative, there's a, uh, a, a sort of a privacy imperative for us as well. It's important we know where the data is stored. And we think that's a, um, a business advantage for us as well. And so we, we're proud to you know, be Kiwi, it's in the, it's in the logo, so um, yeah. Just want to throw that in there as well. Thank you. Yeah, so I, yeah, so I, I guess a question I would ask you: Do you feel that you're at uh, a disadvantage in being very accountable under New Zealand law about your terms and conditions and, and your and your location of your data centres as compared to eBay or or whatever the potential competition is operating in, in New Zealand. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to be in a position, or speaking for myself, but partially for trade me as well, I wouldn't want to be in a position where we were using jurisdiction or data sovereignty as a way of evading any kind of obligation under New Zealand law. That would, that would feel wrong on all sorts of levels. Uh, it's also a bit clearer for us, right? Because if we have your trading history stored in Singapore versus your trading history stored in the state somewhere, and the, the data sovereignty question that I missed the barcamp for sounds fascinating, but you know, what law applies there and what, what obligations do we have? We at least know now what the obligations we have in New Zealand are, and we work closely with the OPC and others to, to make sure that we, we do right by that. So in some ways, knowing what that, that jurisdiction is is really helpful for us because it limits the scope of this weird kind of random, oh, you know, your data was in Bolivia for an hour and subject to all these strange laws you know nothing about. I also th just just to pick up on that too. Just to note, under the Privacy Act, if you're collecting the information in New Zealand, if you send it offshore and something happens, you're still responsible. And maybe, obviously, you might have terms and conditions built into whoever you're storing it with offshore. That means you can sheet back some of the liability to them. But if someone complains to our office about it, we'll be coming and talking to you in the first instance. So it's not entirely possible to evade the Privacy Act just by shipping it offshore. Thank you. So I was thinking of when you're competing with companies that are offshore, and so how do you enforce New Zealand law on, on them? Thank you. Right, so um, just to summarise a few threats that we have uh, right now, I think it's, it's a very good discussion. We have a few threats over here that uh, the first one is about offshore and um, inshore. Um, so uh, there were a few questions. Uh, one is, um, how do we know the jurisdiction um, that is involved and what rights do you have? And um, as, as, as explained, there was you actually are liable for it as well. Um, but how much liability is that? Is it a full one? Uh, maybe um, we can hear from the experts here. Um, 
and then I'll, I'll slowly go through some of the topics as well. Um, the other one is, um, is it even a big problem? Because if the cost uh, is cheaper to do it locally, um, you know, um, probably we, we don't even need to rely. But what if the cost of overseas hosting is extremely cheap? Would it suddenly become a non-issue? Yeah, so these two are kind of linked together. So let's probably discuss about this. Just make a quick comment on data sovereignty. Um, uh, I've run a company that provides um, a system for lawyers that exclusively used by New Zealand lawyers to store some of their documents in. And data sovereignty, uh, we're hosted here in 100% here in New Zealand, but we sort of thought, oh, is that going to be a big issue? But it's actually one of the first questions that all of our clients asked. And, and I'm, you know, don't want to sort of damn anyone with fame praise, but um, I'm, I'm quite impressed um, that it is front of mind. Pretty much the, the first or second question we always get asked is, oh, where's this hosted? And so it's quite pleasing to know a that people are asking it, and b that we can say 100% here in New Zealand. We write it into our contract. It's in our terms and conditions. None of the data goes offshore, even backups, and that's always something to check. Okay, data's hosted here. What about backups? Are you backing up to, you know, some off off uh, um, site um, area. And in terms of data centers actually disappearing, if you like, it has happened. I mean, there are, there are outages, but it has happened. There have been a couple of cases in America where the business has gone broke and there's been a big you know, drama and scramble for physical possession of the servers and all this sort of stuff. And of course, you've got 5,000 customers hosted on, you know, sort of one of these big rack mounted servers. And, um, and there have also been cases, um, uh, and of course, the obvious one is the uh, mega upload. Um, one where suddenly the FBI or whoever it was um, uh, has has your data and you get one of those nice uh, posters saying seized by the FBI when you go to, to log in. Now, hopefully people weren't storing too much uh, business information in uh, Mega Upload. I don't think they were, but um, uh, it's just, you know, it, it is a reality. It has happened. Um, so, yeah, always something to be aware of. I'm just curious about the liability that you mentioned. Can you um, explain to us the extent of it? And in the case that um, maybe a mitigation is needed, what powers does a New Zealand-based uh, individual or organisation have? There's a lot to that, I guess. I, I mean, this, this, the very basic starting point is that under the Privacy Act, agencies are required to take reasonable steps to protect the information, uh, the security of personal information they hold. So obviously if you're doing things like sending data offshore, then what's going to be reasonable steps around making sure you're dealing with a credible provider that has good systems in place, that you know what will happen, where the information's going, all that is sort of the information. I think, I'll look at Tim at this as I say this, that we would be expecting agencies to be aware of. And if this is all new or you want to know more detail, we do actually have some guidance material on um, it's designed for small to medium businesses, but around using cloud computing services. I guess then the question is, if something does go wrong, what could you be liable for? What would we come, what, what are we able to do? Yeah, it, as I said, the first instance, it's the agency who's collected the information that's being held responsible. If that agency was able to show, look, we had absolutely, you know, our terms and conditions are spotless. We've done due diligence. We've checked everything. And it was a human error by someone at a server over offshore that's, you know, we're, we're all human and we make mistakes. That may not necessarily be something that in itself is actually a breach of the Privacy Act. So even to the extent that we can investigate, we might be a bit limited. Um, and then just, I guess, in terms of, well, what happens if they're able to say, no, it's completely not our fault. You need to go talk to someone in America is actually responsible for this. Yeah, that's a really, it's a difficult thing that we're having to deal with, that people are interacting overseas uh, with overseas agencies a lot more and how do we deal with privacy and personal information issues when they're coming up in other jurisdictions. We're increasingly working on networks with other privacy enforcement authorities overseas, so we might not necessarily be able to help you, but we may be able to direct you to the people that can or put you or transfer your complaint to someone who might be able to look at it. But yeah, it's a growing area for us and something that at the moment it's not particularly well um, covered. There's not great coverage, I think, to be completely frank, but it's we're aware of that as being a problem and there are steps being taken. So watch this space, I guess. Are some countries better or worse than others in that respect? And who you can deal with? Um, 
<laughs> can I? Okay. Oh, sorry, can you repeat your question? Yeah. Uh, uh, are there countries that are better or worse in that respect as far as how they look after this sort of data and what recourse you have with dealing with them and connecting with agencies there? Yeah, um, short answer, yes. Um, it's kind of been a failing on our part of the office and, and we're working to rectify it at the moment. Um, a list of countries that have similar privacy laws to New Zealand. Um, our privacy laws are based on the, is it OPE? Yeah, OECD, um, 20 privacy principles, and, and there are privacy regulators all over the world that, that have very similar principles-based um, privacy legislation. Um, within the Asia-Pacific region, there, there are a few. Um, Australia, for example, has very similar privacy legislation to us. Um, but, yeah, in terms of a global picture, um, I think we need to do some more work on that, and, and we are doing that. So, Sarah. You got more. <laughs> Thank you. We'll just, the OPC will just take over the session slowly. Um, and I'll just to, to further add to that, the EU also has some quite stringent data controls around what can be done with transferring information. And New Zealand actually has EU adequacy, which means that they've looked at us and said what, how we deal with um, personal information and how we regulate that is adequate by their standards. So that does open up the potential for us to receive information from Europe, which otherwise isn't able to be sent out of the EU. So that's another sort of a market where there's some quite good regulation. Yeah, and so this maybe gets to the, the question of certification as well. So it seems, it seems like there's kind of some ad hoc movement now towards a certification system. Is there anything more formal happening interna internationally in terms of certification? Uh, ISO standard was mentioned before. Um, yeah, 27001. There's also now 27018, um, which, which is about cloud privacy. Um, we're still getting our heads around it as an office. Um, as Sarah mentioned, we wrote some cloud guidance a while back. We're looking at whether we need to refresh that to say whether 27018 is actually a good standard and if your cloud provider is meeting that, you're probably meeting your privacy expectations. We need to have those discussions, but um, there are a couple of companies already that are, are getting right behind that standard. So, yeah. Isn't there a um, New Zealand um, uh a cloud code of practice, I think, that the IITP um, put, put together. So, I mean, that, that, that covers a lot of it. And, and I just, you know, would rem remember, important to remember that there is a big difference between privacy under the Privacy Act, which deals with personal information, and then the broad, much broader issue of data security and cloud issues and all that sort of thing. For example, probably the majority of the information held in a system like Zero would probably not be personal information, it would be business information, which isn't protected at all by the, by the Privacy Act, except arguably to the extent that it, it you know, relates to an identifiable uh, person. Um, but yeah, pr privacy is a subset, and so certainly um, uh, there's, there are a lot, lot more issues. But yeah, I think that there, so, so there is some sort of, um, I'm not sure what the official status of any is of that New Zealand cloud of, uh, code, cloud code of conduct. That's exactly what I was going to bring up, um, because when I worked at Zero, I was involved in their application for the, the code, code of practice, and um, yep. I just had a quick look up online, and there, there are 17 companies signed up to the code of practice, and another seven described as in progress, and I was wondering whether, uh, you know, whether that code of practice is seen as the solution to a, to a lot of people's concerns. Or it doesn't go far enough, or or um, or is it just a, a stopgap measure um, until some more of these uh, international regulations and that come on board? I, I know when the code of practice was being formed, the Australians were looking over at it and saying, "Wow, we need something like that." And I wonder whether this stuff so undeveloped uh, that we're we're just in a, a very early stages of that, and and it might be some time before international catches up with everything and, 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 and we start to get a consensus globally and then we might get uh, countries able to help enforce each other's requirements. 
Um, I can answer your question in a sense because I serve on the um, leadership team in Cloud Security Alliance and also I, I sit in the SC27 for ISO standardization as a member of, of the organization. So um, globally, there are a few, um, uh, a few things that are, that are going on to remedy that. Um, for example, the, uh, the Cloud Security Alliance have uh, uh, what they call a Cloud Control Matrix, which um, links up different reg regulations across different countries so that you, you have a guidance on how to do that. And then from the other side, you have the, uh, a, a registry, which is like a, um, a certification process, so to say, uh, where a, a, cloud can, a cloud provider can say that I'm, uh, it's called a STAR, STAR certification, S-T-A-R. I uh, can't remember the exact uh, full name, but the STAR certified thing. So for example, in, uh, in, in, um, in different parts of Asia Pacific, there are different cloud providers which say I'm a STAR certified, this standard, uh, this level standard. Um, and um, actually the New Zealand uh, cloud code also uh, was uh, was worked together with with some some contributions from CSA as well. Um, with regards to ISO standardization, um, some of the work that are going on, um, I think the the challenge for all these regulations is that um, they they can hold something to account, but at the same time that might be too late. Um, so um, what I would like to move into the next uh, part of this discussion is that um, I want to know uh, if any one of you feel that you are in control right after you upload a photo on Facebook or a document in Google Drive. Is there anyone who feels this way? No, it's, there's nothing wrong if you feel that way, but, but if you do, we want to hear from you. No, no one? So, so there must be some, some issue there, right? Um, what do you think are the main reasons for, for, for such a feeling of lack of control? Can, can I just interject something there? We in the room are aware of what's going on, but the general public, I would suggest, when they put a photo or put files into a Google Drive once they've figured out how to do it, they probably think that it's actually quite safe. And that's, that's where the smoke and mirrors kind of comes in. Yeah, I was going, I was going to say something similar that uh, for those of us that have been around a long time on the internet, it's, there was an old saying that you, you I can't remember exact words, but you, you, had, you assumed if you put something online, it was public. And that was, you work on that basis. But as, as the broad public has joined the internet, they've been people have thought that, oh, well, it's got passwords, so therefore it must be, <laughs> it must be private to me and secure. And uh, there's still, a, um, and meanwhile, uh, technologists on the internet have tried to create secure security on top of the internet to try and make what the public thinks somehow real. But we're in this, we're still in some sort of, I think we're still in some sort of fantasy zone there. Um, we still need to assume that once it's on the internet it's, it's public and and live with that risk that it might go somewhere so all your if you make what you're doing is you if you're thinking about it if clearly you you're weighing up that risk all the time or you're making you, know, you have a rule of thumb for yourself of what you put up there and that's you just accept that that's uh, that's what you're living with okay so maybe I'll want to pass the ball back to Ryan uh, so let's say I uploaded a file to Google Drive. Why would you think it's not or any less under your control than if it's on your own hard drive? Uh, so why would it be less? I mean, let's just take it. Yeah, it's there. It's on my drive. And I can delete it if I like to. And I can change it. I can do whatever I like with it. And I can share it with my friends or not share it. It's completely under my control. Um, so, just to share the perspective is once you upload it into uh, Google Cloud, you will have four or five redundant copies immediately um, replicated across the Google's infrastructure. Right. <laughs> and um, 
some of the some of the the system administrators might have uh, an access to that. So in 2010, there was a there was a uh, there was a site reliability engineer from Google uh, who was caught um, snooping on uh, teenage girls and boys conversation in GTalk. So they called him G Crip. Yeah, and um, and. This guy, um, what's scary is not that he did that. He did the, not that he did the stalking as uh, and abused the rights of a system administrator, but what's scary was that the extent of his actions were not known. Yeah, so that's that's the that's the. I hope that's a... <laughs> right. Okay, so as you can see, that was a provocative question. Uh, but let me give my example. When I was, uh, when I'm, I'm working at a university and the university administrators moved mailboxes from uh, the university server uh, and put them onto Google Mail, uh, the reason was they felt that the administrators at the university may be spying, may, may be looking at it. Uh, I was one of them, and I'm pretty sure they weren't. But anyway, um, but they felt, oh, Google, it's it's out there somewhere in California, and no one there would care what we do. Uh, so there is, I think, the other side of it as well. If it's there in your company data center, there's people there who might really want to look at them. If it's at Google, who cares? I mean, in a sense, you know, some Google guy in California looks at my email, so what does it matter to me? Uh, so there is that attitude as well, uh, which I think to a large extent has some justification. And I guess what you're saying is it's about distance. The closer you are to something or that people feel that you are to something, the more personal they think it's going to be. And yes, somebody is going to look at my stuff if it's held in Auckland. But if it's held somewhere else, it's like they don't know who I am, they don't care who I am. Um, and this is something that's been going on right from the start, you know, having battles with um, family members who couldn't understand why their internet bills were so high. It's because you've got an open wireless and all your neighbours are using it. Why would they want to use my internet? <laughs> what, what, yeah. Why would they want to get into my computer? What do they care about my computers? You don't understand. And that's the thing. It's not just what we're doing. It's the perception and trying to change people's minds when they're inherently, I keep saying lazy, and it's not entirely fair because people are busy, people have got things to do, they don't have time to be checking all these things, and they so they trust. And that's, that's ultimately and perhaps what's really happening is that trust is being um, misused. That should be on, or is it on? Sweet, cool. Um, so there are, is that additional idea of um, not only having it stored in New Zealand, but also having um, the backups as well, um, so that you also trust the company to not only have your data, but protect your data against uh, natural disasters in many cases. So especially if it's business data, um, or if it's just personal photos and that, um, the case, an exception being um, the case of mega upload, where a lot of personal data was irretrievably um, taken away and it was stored um, locally as well, but of course you also got the local copies removed as well. Um, however, some companies and data centres will do backups in New Zealand locally, so they won't always be overseas, but there are even more increasing ways um, that don't provide you that information to make a choice as a consumer. And so if you take, say, some of the wireless um, share information that um, Windows 10 is advertising that it will provide to share your Wi-Fi details with your friends easily and almost um, without your need to actually determine who you're sharing it with, that sort of idea is kind of, um, in a way, it's developed without privacy in mind. And I think it's not the user who has to make the choice to opt out of every single machine install they go to. It should actually be, at the beginning, a system that you need to opt into, I think, instead. Um, and that design decision, as, as many people say, should come into the, in the forefront of clients or developers or managers' minds when they look to 
design these systems for users is providing those features, is looking at providing that information. And a lot of the time, that's just not even a consideration, I think, which is a bit of a worry. If it was made a consideration or mandatory even, that would be quite useful. Thank you. I, th I think both that <coughs> that subject and also the availability and the, and the location of the cloud storage um, comes down to tolerances. And I think we, we tend to um, get bombarded with either end of the spectrum, but in actual fact, everybody has a point on that spectrum where they're comfy with with the risk and the, the availability, perhaps, and that might be an individual comfort or it might be a corporate comfort, and it varies from individual to company to, to, to whoever. Um, and I think that, to your earlier point, what we probably need to do is make sure people are making that conscious decision around that threshold. What are they comfortable with? Because I think, you know, the, 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 um, the point around the the next generation may not know that. They might be um, inheriting the tolerances of their uh, their peers, their parents, their whoever. Um, and, and to what degree do we need to kind of educate them in the ways in which they, or give them the information they need to be able to decide what tolerances they are happy with around that stuff. What's really true in that, which I've just seen my daughter, in order to keep her quiet, put a couple of games on the tablet. I accept it's just a button that you push as a part of the process. It doesn't mean anything to her now. It's not going to mean anything to her in 10 or 15 years' time unless we actually teach her otherwise. Um, and I kind of feel like I'm hogging it, but I've got a, a question to ask. Is it naive to, to ask, traditionally in business, if something goes wrong with a the business, there, there are files, there is information, there is data that Business have, businesses have been kept, have kept all along information on their customers, suppliers, whatnot. Traditionally, if a company goes bankrupt and there's information there, what happens to that and how is it any different now to the way it was in, in the fully papered world, the pre-computer world, apart from volume? Um, I think there are two aspects of that. Uh, one is the legal aspect, which I would Sick if there's any legal expert in this, then I can go on the technical as well. Well, I, I think in short, it depends on the value of the information. I mean, um, if it's um, you know just a, a, a bunch of employee files that probably have no commercial value, then um, no one's probably going to care a whole lot about it. On the other hand, if the company has a highly valuable database of, of marketing information that that company legitimately owns, uh, and then the company is in receivership or liquidation, then the receiver or liquidator um, may, and is perfectly legally entitled to, um, uh, sell that asset off. Um, uh, and this is an example of where data can go sideways. Now, again, this all assumes that that data has been lawfully collected by that business in the first place, and they've got the right to sort of sell it and or distribute it to third parties. And as you say, you click on the, oh, I accept, I accept, I accept, you know, so you've probably given the company uh, all of those rights anyway. So um, I think, yeah, from, you know, legally, yes, it's possible. Um, and, and it's really just a question of you know, how valuable that asset is. And again, you can think of, easily think of scenarios where customer databases, um, you know, sales databases, and there have been lots of examples in, um, where, uh, for example, aggrieved, not, not, not in a situation where a company's collapsed, but where like an aggrieved employee um, has taken the customers, uh, taken their customer list and gone to a, and set up their own business and then gone and contacted all the ex-customers. Nothing necessarily to do with privacy, but again, issues of, you know, data security, data control, confidentiality, a whole, whole range of issues uh, come in there. All I'd just really add to that is that that's not, it's not massively different to how it was before. Or it, it is, the difference is really to, vo no, to volume. Um, thinking about the when we all tap on I agree uh, and all those sorts of things, and the terms and conditions are ridiculously long. No one's going to read them. Um, no one's going to look up uh, probably the cloud code of conduct either to read all the details about what uh, companies have, have signed up to and it's and it's sort of one big thing that standard thing for all of them but I wonder if there's uh, solutions in the in the same way that we have on our tin of beans food labeling and uh, that's that gives us a summary of things and maybe there's a solution there ultimately in the long term for websites to say yep your data's held here uh, that we take these precautions, blah, 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 and it's all about consumer information. Is that the, the, where we might be heading? 
some st- yeah. Thank you. That may well be a thing that the OPC want to comment on, but the um, the private sector starting to fill fill the gap anyway because uh, uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation at the moment does a really a really good kind of grid system with ticks and things. This company does this, doesn't do that, is good, is bad. And there are a couple others as well. I, I like the EFF one, but Mike, do you want to say anything to that? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, our office is currently looking into transparency reporting um, and what our office's role might be in that um, in both encouraging business to look at how they disclose um, government requests uh, for people's information and as well as maybe providing a platform for those reports to, to be accessed to. Um, we, we're talking to business at the moment. We we don't quite know what that looks like. Um, we're, we've, we've talked to Trade Me, and, and that's why, why Guy pointed the microphone at me. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's been really good to, to have those conversations and realise what the costs on business are to... to um, get that sort of reporting done. Um, the the other thing that we we've murmured about in the office, and we're doing some exploration on, is um, that idea of whether we can provide a privacy tick, or, or whether there's that sort of thing. And that that doesn't give you the whole picture of commercial business as well. But um, in terms of a a user side of things, just a person using the internet, there's a service. Terms of service didn't read. A website on the internet, and maybe there's room for someone in the in the business um, environment, whether it's here or overseas, to start building that for for businesses, um, because it's not always the person who reads through all the technical terms who actually signs the contract in the end. So, all right, I, quite, I quite like the idea of a recommended minute. daily intake of Facebook, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, so just to wrap up, uh, I mean, to answer your question, technically, I think um, the cloud with its redundancy is actually, it's not same old, same old. It's actually much better than the traditional way of uh, doing uh, IT. But um, we need to have some controls over who gets to see it and how is it passed around. Um, then to to kind of wrap up what we have, I think some of the concerns that we see are usually about the liability and what happens to the data when it gets overseas. And that's one of the reasons why um, some of the banking industries, the healthcare industries, um, industries that, that, that handle um, sensitive data are always the slow adopters of cloud and has always been and will probably be <laughs> until the next few years. Um, and that's the reason why we are doing the Stratus project. So just a quick overview of the Stratus project is that um, it's a work done by University of Waikato, Auckland, Unitech, and the Cloud Security Alliance. Um, so if you know anyone there uh, and you want to contribute your, your ideas or um, you know that's the nearest uh, institutions to you, um, you can go and find out a little bit more information from here. The other thing that we probably want to, so we have engaged uh, the industry partners. The focus is to help New Zealand be the leader in creating solutions, technical solutions, which are aligned to policies and legal uh, aspects of things to actually to, uh, to be the leader in the world to empower people to help themselves with regards to control. So when you put something up into Facebook, you will have a technology which will allow you to stop someone from looking at it if you want to, and you'll know who. So those are difficult uh, challenge questions, and hence we are working on it on a six-year roadmap. We have just uh, about to finish the first year, but right now we are trying to engage the users more and more because um, we have the technologies, but we need to get out of the ivory tower. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, and uh, we really appreciate if you have feedback for us uh, along the way. Yeah. Anything to add, Boom? Um, yes, uh, it's running out of time. Yeah, uh, yeah so, <laughs> so okay. I guess uh, we can okay. conclude. Uh, let you guys, we don't understand between you and lunch. So, yep, uh, thank you very much. And yeah. Yeah, thanks for your time. Okay. Mm.